last time there was rain, I smelt it in the air and filled a pail to wash my hair. My kids was in the yard, I made them play inside, the smallest one, the boy, he cried. The last time there was rain, the rich red earth was soaked, and up them baby corn shoots poked. The spill off from the ditch made gullies in the ground, and birds which ate the bugs made such a pretty sound. When the last rain came, when the last rain came, and the sky turned blue, and the sky turned blue, it was gone for good, it was gone for good, only no one knew, only no one knew. We enjoyed the shade with the cherry fig. When it's warm like Oklahoma is, Bravo, Ricky. Bravo, Michael. Welcome to Conversations. Our guest today, for the first of a two-part chat, are composer Ricky Ian Gordon and librettist Michael Corey. Conversations is Lehman College's series of discussions with major theater and musical figures of our time. Welcome to the show, Ricky Ian Gordon and Michael Corey. Uh, and thank you, uh, thank you so much for that beautiful aria from uh, your opera, Grapes of Wrath, uh, uh, The Last Time There Was Rain. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, you, uh, you've had a, a smash hit opera on your hands uh, uh, that you did in Minnesota. Uh, I love saying smash hit opera. opera. I like it. Uh, really. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's fabulous. This opera is now going to be done in, uh, that was done in Minneapolis. It's going to be done in Utah in May of 2007, is that right? Mm -hmm. Pittsburgh, November of 2008, and at the Houston Grand Opera in March of 2009. Are there any other productions? Yeah, another company in California, Opera Pacific, just signed on. Oh, that's a Los biggie. Angeles. That's great. Yeah. That's a biggie. And, uh, and then Cousin Gordon, Paris yes. South, and then that in the Lyric Opera. Yeah. In, your, in, your in his wildest <laughs> dream. <laughs> <laughs> but that's in my mind's <laughs> eye. Uh, <laughs> that's wonderful. How does it feel to have written an opera that has pleased so many people so far? It feels good. I tell you, it was just a relief. I had yeah. been, it's been a long time since I did a big opera, and uh, I forgot that there are no previews in opera. And you have to design this thing to get it right on the first night when everybody shows up in their tuxedos and evening gowns and the critics come with their, with their knives. <laughs> and uh, it has to be right the first night, which is an, an absurd thing. It doesn't give the composer no. and the lyricist a uh, chance to really look at their work in front of audiences. You don't know where they're going to laugh, applaud, walk out. So that it worked was kind of miraculous. And that they liked it was icing on the cake. Yeah, it's funny because there was a, there was a big dinner before it and that started at 5 o'clock and the whole time and, you know, and there's all these speeches and they're sort of mostly about Michael and I and you're thinking at 11.15 tonight all the toys could be taken <laughs> away. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily they weren't. I, uh, for those of our, in our audience, our studio and uh, home audience, uh, I wanted to talk about uh, the two of you. Uh, 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 forgive me for reading it, but there's so much information here. Uh, it's um, 
Ricky, uh, we'll start with you. Mm -hmm. uh, you're known for work, music, for concert hall, opera, dance, uh, theater, and film. The greatest singers of our time have recorded your works, including Audra McDonald, Dawn Upshaw, Renee Fleming, Elizabeth Futrell. In October of 2005, you, you won an OB for Orpheus and Eurydice. Uh, we're going to see a piece of that later. A song cycle and two acts for clarinet and piano. And it was choreographed. And you collaborated with Richard Nelson on a, on a musical, My Life with Albertine, that played at play, Playwrights Horizons. And uh, in the interest of full disclo disclosure, uh, uh, in 2002, uh, the two of us created uh, Morningstar and commissioned from the Lyric Opera of Chicago. Um, Dream True opened at the Vineyard Theater and won all kinds of awards. Uh, you wrote another opera with uh, uh, Jean-Claude Van Italy, uh, the Tibetan Book of the Dead. I mean, this is, this is incredible accomplishment. Michael uh, is, of course, the uh, lyricist of the smash hit musical Grey Gardens currently playing on Broadway. Um, uh, you were nominated for Drama Desk and Outer Critic Circles Award for, for your work in that, in that piece. Uh, you and composer Scott Frankel received ASCAP Awards f uh, and Richard Rogers New Horizon Awards. Uh, you have two new shows in development, Doll and Meet Mr. Future. I can't wait to see them. Uh, you've written libretti for, uh, uh, for Stuart Wallace, including Harvey Milk. We're going to see a piece uh, of that and Hopper's Wife, which I've never heard of. Dying to see that one. You wrote the libretto for Kabbalah and Where's Dick? Uh, that sounds obscene. Uh, it was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you co-wrote um, um, doctor lyrics for Dr. Zhivago. It goes on and on. I, uh, 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 so you guys are very accomplished guys. I, I just, uh, I'm very glad you're here and you're friends of mine. Thank uh, you. We're glad to be here. Uh, yeah. uh, I thought we should show a montage, uh, the lengthiest montage we've ever shown on, uh, on this show, of The Grapes of Wrath. I think our audience would like to get a flavor. And then afterward, would you identify who's doing what?
That's just beautiful, you guys. It's just beautiful. Whatever possessed you to write an opera uh, on the, the one of the, the the greatest classics of American literature, John Steinbeck's *Grapes of Wrath*? What? Uh, I had to. I was asked. I was approached by Minnesota Opera, and so because I can't, I can't say that that would have been my idea to do. And um, it was so terrifying that I had to include Michael in the terror. <laughs> yeah, to frighten me. <laughs> <laughs> we live a block apart. He's on the, on the Upper West Side. We right. always bump into each other at the corner grocery and say, we must work together someday. Right. And one day we bumped and he said, think about the Grapes of Wrath, as I said, as an opera. I said, you're nuts. I have a short story is long enough for an opera. <laughs> uh, that's massive. And I, I was afraid of it, too. Uh, and I had always done originals, never adapted it. And, you know, when you're dealing with Steinbeck, you're dealing with possibly the great American novel. And the whole question of can a novel be turned into an opera? Um, but Ricky said, just read it. And I read it, and I felt it was musically written and written in three acts. And we talked about it, and we realized it was an opera. And, it, you know, it's, I had just read it on the plane going to, to and from California, and I had this sense that, the whole idea of being asked to make an opera out of something like that is a gift. It's a magnificent story. And though it's awe-inspiring to think of writing it, the idea also of entering it seemed so profound and life-changing to me. And Michael and I have talked about it. I had some ideas about what it should be formally in terms of, you know, a set-piece opera like a Porgy and Bess or Regina or Street Scene as opposed to a sort of through-written thing. And to me, Michael is such a superb lyricist. It seemed like I, I, I had this sense, I think we can do this. Well, songs seemed right for Steinbeck, an opera made of songs. And I have to say that the other great reason for doing it is that it's as timely as ever. Yes. In the world we now live in, we're facing the same problems that the Joad family faced in the, the Dust Bowl era of America. These farmers who were thrown off their land and had to migrate to California look for work, were chewed up by the capitalistic system. Now it's on a global scale, and we see the same issues being addressed. People wanting to build fences between borders of countries. Um, and we said, that's, that's what writers and composers look for, a way of yeah. connecting with our world without underlining in red, letting the audience get there themselves. And the idea of governments failing right. when the earth misbehaves. You know, I mean, the idea of Katrina, the Sudan, you know, drought. It's it's so prevalent the at this Bowl moment. The era is the equivalent of uh, Hurricane Katrina. Yeah. Yes. Um, how long did it take you to write the opera? We we, we not it long was three comparatively, years. which is a short for an opera, as yeah. you know, Bill. Uh, you discussed the structure of it, and of course we had right. a great novel to work and to choose what what would be operatized. Uh, the outline discussions with directors, and then we decided it had to be done in three acts, which is an epic form. And I would write an act and give it to Ricky, and he'd be composing that as I would be writing the next act. Altogether, including orchestration, three years. Three well, years. What was the very first step uh, of this process? An well, outline. An yeah, outline. outline and talking about how we wanted to approach it. Like I said, talking about what kind of form would it take and then Michael actually did an unbelievably great and very thorough outline. And then I wasn't supposed to write any music until Michael had the whole libretto done, but he did one act, and I nearly fell off my chair when I read that act and started setting it the next day. Well, I procrastinated, of course, because once the outline was figured out, then I was scared. How, how could I capture the voice of Steinbeck and, and allow Rick, give Ricky the stuff he needed to make it sing? And it wasn't until I got the first line of the opera that it all flowed. And the first, the first line, line was, the last time there was rain. And that was kind of an invention, a reinvention of Steinbach. I said, if we open the opera on the Dust Bowl in a depressed state with gloomy people, um, that is not as involving as opening the stage on a beautiful green field. Right. People remembering the past, and then you're invested in what they had and what they lost. And by the time it begins, you're into their story. And by the time that number ends, 
the corn is dead, yeah. and and Michael gives them. And we the, see that transition. We see yeah. the corn dying yeah. in front of our eyes. We that see is, the birth of the dust bowl. That is just a spectacular notion of uh, way to begin this. Uh, uh, the way to begin this piece. Uh, uh, how long is the opera? The opera, when we did it in um, Minnesota, was what three forty-five with two twenty-minute in intermissions. intermissions. So it's that's a about three hours of music. Yeah, it's a blockbuster. Yeah, it is. It's a big blockbuster. It's a half a ring cycle. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the, the story is terrific. Yeah, it's a great story that Steinbeck wrote, and we. We gave ourselves the goal of doing the entire story. Right. So yeah. the audience comes there and, uh, and they're in for uh, an epic story, epic storytelling. They're in for a story and really they, they get involved in all the characters. The main character is really the family itself. But uh, some of the people we heard singing in the excerpts, Tom Jode is the, uh, is the uh, middle brother of the family and he's right. just been in jail. Brian Lear Huber was the same. Yes. He doesn't want to get arrested again. He wants to keep his nose clean and stay out of trouble. But social events transpire, conspire to make him violent again, to fight back for his rights. This is the story of the Joad family. Yes. Mm -hmm. And there's the sister, Rosa Sharn, who's pregnant, and uh, her, her pregnant baby, which is born dead at the end of the opera, is a symbol of the hope that uh, expires. Uh, there's the strong earth mother, Ma Jode. There's the very weak father. There's the drunkard brother, Uncle John. And we see that we just saw all those. Uh, yes, yeah. yeah. and we follow them through this kind of tapestry as they go from Oklahoma, where then they are evicted, across the Mojave Desert to California, the promised land, where they expect to find jobs because they've been handed leaflets, handbills that promise employment for everybody who comes. People but are still going to California for and the same still, reasons. And they're <laughs> still buying the same lives. Yeah. And, and, and Ricky found this theme in the music, kind of a huckster theme. It appears in a used car lot. It appears when they read the handbills. It's a kind of lie of capitalism. And, and uh, then it's the big... Uh, what is the lie of capitalism as you see it? Well, uh, the American dream that everybody can have it. Um, but in fact... Uh, I think what Steinbeck was saying is that corporations come first. That not everyone can Not have everybody can no. get it. There's and a they're pecking losers, order. And, and they're losers in right, this And in order for dream. people to be on top, some people have to be put onto the bottom, mm -hmm. and their past and history has to be stripped away from them mm -hmm. so that they can become cogs in the machine and serve it. Mm -hmm. and, and the first step is by eradicating someone's history. That's what Ma Jode sings about. This land used to be us. All the things we had were us. Who are we going to be without our stuff? That's what that aria that you sing, that the first line of that aria is, this dead land is us. All its hardship is us. And that's a direct quote from Steinbeck. It's so musical that we just chose it and said it. Would you say you got a fair number of lines from the uh, I would say that in every piece there is a line or two directly from Steinbeck, right. and what I would do is emulate the, the rhythm of the lines in the rest mm -hmm. um, uh, to, to, to give Ricky the structure uh, of a libretto that he needed to set. I remember when I read the, uh, the book many years ago, I was struck by how biblical it, it sounded. It felt like... Uh, uh, the cadences were from the King James Bible. Well, totally, and then it ends there with are. the Pieta. It ends with the Pieta. There's the, the, the baby that Rosa Sharn mm -hmm. finally gives birth to is stillborn, and uh, they, Uncle John sends it down the river like a, in a fruit a crate. A Moses. A Moses image. Little dead Moses. And we called it Little Dead Moses, mm -hmm. and it says, Go into every town, show them your withered face, and ask who did this and why. Mm -hmm. Ricky, uh, you are most definitely uh, a lyric composer, uh, most definitely. What composers helped you to dare to be a lyric composer? In this day and age, to be a lyric composer as blatantly lyric as you are is a, an, act of, uh, an act of defiance almost. Uh, uh, what possessed you? Well, first of all, I have to say that, that that assumes that, that there is another composer living inside you that could actually be current and in mm -hmm. style and, you know, exactly what mm -hmm. the critics of the New York Times would want you to write. But there's only one composer that lives in you, and there's only the music mm -hmm. you hear. 
I'm inspired probably by a lot of lyric composers. I'm very inspired by Britain. I was inspired Benjamin by Benjamin Britten. Benjamin Britten, by Kurt Weill, by um, um, Minotti, early Minotti. I love the console. I love I love Mark Blitzstein, the Mark Blitzstein of you know the Cradle Will Rock and Regina. Uh, in general, I like a lot of lyric composers, you know, and. Uh, I love melody, you know, and I love voices. My first love was the voice, and in particular, my mother's voice. My mother, as you know, is a singer, comedian in the Borscht Belt. <laughs> so, so my first love was her voice, and then the voice in general. I, it feels like you guys have joined the tradition of opera, as opposed to uh, reinventing opera. You are have joined. Is that a fair thing to say? I think that these days there are a lot of musicals that are influenced mm -hmm. by opera. Yeah. Uh, there's all the, the big Andrew Lloyd Webber shows and uh, the, the French, uh, the Les Mis, mm -hmm. uh, and they're, they're picking up some of the great things of that opera, which is the passion, the continuous music, right. um, and they, they're trying to do it with more modern styles. I would say that uh, so the, the, the musicals influenced by opera, I would say this is an opera influenced by musicals, oh, and unabashedly. Yes. Oh, that's wonderful. I think that's really well put. Yeah. Who, uh, which uh, librettists have influenced you? Well, I love stories. I love theater, mm -hmm. and I just think that what opera is is really the putting a play out onto the furthest limb and asking these great actors who are opera singers to use every bone and of their body to create this sound. It's the ultimate kind of play. So I don't really differentiate between operas and great theater. It's Shakespeare is in opera and vice versa. Right. Uh, they're telling me uh, that we have to bring this first part to a close. I, it's, we've got it. It's been so quick. Uh, Ricky, uh, as we go out, would you take us out on that exquisite aria of Ma Jode's uh, Fried Dough? Uh, from your and Michael Corey's beautiful opera, The Grapes of Wrath. Yes. <laughs> I, I wanted to thank you and our studio audiences and home audience for joining us today, and we hope to see you again soon for further conversation. Thank you so much. So pale and pasty, why you think his color he saw? Fried dough, fried dough. It only take one peek to know. Fried dough. Look at your sister. Waste into nothing with a baby trying to grow. Fried dough, fried dough. Without no milk, it be born slow. I know. Here we got showers, plenty hot water. Nothing to put in the cook pot. And I mean nothing. One day grease is all we got.